Welcome to the Covenance Getting Started class, the class that will show you how to use systematic review software, Covenance, to get the best out of your systematic review. This is an overview of what we're going to look at today. We'll give you a quick rundown of, of Covenance, what it does, an explanation of what it is, what it can do for you, how to set up an account, which can be a bit tricky sometimes, how to create a new review, how to add references to be screened for your review. Uh, we'll look at team settings, tags, which will help you along with your process. Screening articles at both title and abstract and full text stages. We'll have a quick look at extracting data and talk about the benefits and limitations of the software. Now, First of all, your liaison librarian has been doing systematic reviews for a while. So that they're a good person to call to start with. We can help you with the understanding of the process and starting to get the ball rolling. We can help you with getting you acquainted with some of the tools that you can use that will really help you in your journey. Things like EndNote, Covidence, and Invivo. So pretty much first port of call. The systematic review process, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, the first bit is we identify all relevant published and unpublished evidence. That's pretty much what librarians have been doing for a long time. So that's, that's where we have the greatest amount of experience. The next step is to select studies or reports for inclusion in your final set that will take part of the review. Uh, assess the quality of each study or report. Then we synthesize the findings from individual studies or reports in an unbiased way. Then to interpret the findings and present a balanced and impartial summary of the findings with due consideration of any flaws in the evidence. Now learning about systematic reviews, contact your librarian. Your liaison librarian is well placed to lead you through the process to explain how the process works. We, we have some classes and I think it's always an advantage to understand what's coming up when, you, when you're doing a systematic review. We run advanced searching for health in your literature or systematic review, systematic review tips and tricks, and there is a training calendar that you can go to. It tells you when these classes are on. And before you do one of, uh, before you do a systematic review, I think going to these classes is, is, is absolutely vital. So what Covidence can do for you? Well, it's not really there to show you how to do a systematic review, but I hope that you would understand the systematic review process by going to the classes and talking to your liaison librarian before you embark on your confidence journey. But it's used to organize and store the screening process. That is the most important thing that confidence does and it does it very, very well. And it, being a web-based piece of software, it allows you or it allows people in the team to work at the same time on the screening process from different locations, which is a, it's a great advantage. So the web-based part of it is very, very important. Uh, screening in, in Covidence is made so easy. It's, it's often been a daunting process, but Covidence, uh, Covidence really helps out. Now, how your liaison librarian can help. Now, what, I go on a lot about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is framing your question. You have to get your question right to have a good systematic review. It's vitally important. I see a lot of people who think they're ready to start a systematic review, but their question is not quite right. And you need to take the time to frame your question. We're also there to help you decide on the databases that you'll use. <clears throat> And of course, running searches, search strategies is, is what we've always done. And we're very good at that. And we're very, very happy to take part in that. Now, as far as confidence goes, we can help you to set up your account and we can give you instruction on how to use confidence. 
Now, there are bits that liaison librarians are not really there to help with. And we're not really all about the screening process or data extraction, quality assurance, meta-analysis, statistical analysis, all falls outside of the realm of the liaison librarian. We, we can help a little, but generally that's outside of, of what we do. Uh, sometimes there are technical issues with Covidence, and um, I have found that uh, the people at Covidence are, are, are very helpful and it, it's a good place to get help from. And um, they are the place to go when there are problems with the software itself. And often it's, it's easier than you think. Now, setting up an account, it can be quite tricky and I've had a few people have problems with this. Now, we'll look at this slide, but let's, let's go and do it live, I think. So I've just done a search for Covidence in the library search. And I'll click on this. And what we will see is what we first need to do is sign up with Covidence. So if we click on this, it takes us to this page. Now from this page, we can see the information that tells us, and this is vitally important, when you're signing up with Covidence, you need to use your .uq.edu.au email. That will link it to the library subscription and will make it far easier to use and far fewer problems. Let's go to the UQ Library Covidence page. Now from this page, you put in your name and your email address, remembering .uq.edu.au and request an invitation. I hope that explains how you, you receive your invitation and when you accept your invitation, you then have access to an unlimited number of systematic reviews. Uh, but like I said, you need to have signed up to Covidence beforehand. Okay. Now let's, let's go live to set up a new review. And we can tell, this is what mine looks like when, when I go to it. If I want to start a new review, I can click here. And this tells me that I have unlimited reviews left. And I will start a new review here. Okay, so I, I have created a new review and I have the options now to add or remove reviewers. But what I think I'll do first is we might add some references. We might add references to our review first. And for adding references, generally what you would have done when you're doing your systematic review, you would have done your literature searching and you most likely would have put all of those references into an EndNote library. Now, EndNote talks to Covidence very well. You, what you need to do, though, is you need to add your references to Covidence by creating an XML file from your EndNote library take the XML option and let, let's do that now. Um, well, I've done that. I've created an XML file for us to put into the EndNote library. So let's do that. And we'll import some references. 
import from file. And when we're importing our references into Covidence, we need to decide what part of the Covidence process we're going to import the references into. And what I'm going to do first, of course, is the screening process. But if we wanted to import later into the full, full text review process, we would need to ensure the full text was there. For us at this stage, for the screening process, we want to make sure that all of the articles that we're bringing in have the abstract. And we'll choose the file. See, we have an XML file here. Let's try this. Into the screening process, choose our file, done that, import. What Covidence will do when it imports files, it will delete duplicates as you go. So we've imported three studies in there to screen. Okay. So we've imported our references. We have references to screen. We can import references any, any number of times. And if there is a problem when, when you import references, you will have a list of the most recent imports and you can get rid of a specific import if you've imported some by accident. Okay. What we can do now is let's invite some reviewers. And the important thing, probably the most valuable thing that, that Covidence does is it enables you to share the reviewing process. And to invite reviewers is, is a simple process. I'm going to invite Miranda. Miranda will receive an email and I'll invite Kirsty. Okay, and they will receive invitations to uh, the review. And the people that you invite don't need to be UQ people. You can invite people from, from anywhere. Uh, if they're not UQ people, they won't have any rights to uh, the UQ software after this review is finished, but they will certainly be able to work on this review when they are invited. Okay. And I'll pass on to Kirsty for the next part. Thanks, Marcos. I'm just about to share my screen. Okay, we're going um, to take a look at team settings. So in this section, we'll be discussing the team settings option in Covidence, why this is important and how you can define the parameters. For an effective systematic review, there's usually a minimum of three team members with two of them screening and the third acting to resolve any disputes. Covidence manages this process very well. Many systematic reviews also have more than three reviewers and other reviewers may specialise in specific areas such as statistical analysis, search design and management. 
um, or other areas. So not all the reviewers will be involved in all the aspects of the review and systematic reviews often require you to define who's involved in what section of the review. So the team settings function in Covidence allows you to set these parameters and let the software manage the access to each section. The software can also keep track and report on the team and its progress and individual members progress within the stages of the review. Okay, so now we'll take a look at the rules of the team settings. If you have a larger team, it's best to manage the rules so that only the people with the appropriate expertise have access to the sections. It helps with consistency. So under the Manage Rules tab, you can manage who can screen, extract data, resolve conflicts during these processes. You can do this separately for each of these three stages. And you can also access team settings from the bottom of each section in the review summary module. The process is a little different in the extraction mode. So when you assign reviewers to the must extract group, only those reviewers will be able to act as the first reviewer for either quality assessment or data extraction. Everyone else in the team will be assigned to the second reviewer. Reviewers who are assigned to resolve conflicts will be able to perform the consensus step for either the quality assessment or data extraction. Those that are not members will only be able to complete um, their own forms or view the final consensus. So we will now, um, so the next tab, is criteria and exclusion reasons. So this is under the next tab under settings. This is where you can manually place your inclusion or exclusion criteria for your review. So although it's not a compulsory part of the process in Covidence, you don't need to do it to create or advance your review. It's recommended that you take the time to do this. This helps to ensure that all the reviewers are on the same page with what to include or exclude during the screening process and it's easy to access this whilst they're screening. So if someone's working on this in the middle of the night and they can't remember what's been decided in terms of um, the parameters of exclusion inclusion, they can just log in and see it in Covidence rather than getting a text from your research colleagues in the middle of the night. So next, um, we're going to have a look at exclusion reasons for full text review and how to manage them. So a default list of full text exclusion reasons is provided and these can be tailored for your own review. The reasons detailed here will be the ones you can choose as an exclusion reason during the full text review process. So here's some of the default ones which have been set up. These are automatically recorded in the Prisma chart within Covidence. It is very important to have consistency in this list. This section is not able to be locked down within Covidence. So it's recommended that either one person be given responsibility for adding and deleting exclusion reasons, or that this is actually set up by the group at the start and is not changed without consensus from the group. The exclusion reasons can also be added during the full text screening process and not just within the settings area. So if you do discover um, additional exclusion reasons along the way that you wish to add and you have consensus as a group, you can add them at any stage of the review. I have a cautionary tale from my own experience in regards to making sure that this is a controlled list. So the cautionary tales from my own experience, multiple reviewers, as you can see here, were adding reasons for full text exclusion as they went along reviewing the papers. Now, as the uh, librarian on the systematic review, I was heavily involved at the beginning, but wasn't involved in the screening process. But then towards the end, I needed to have a look at the Prisma chart and finalize it. So when I had a look, I saw that multiple reviewers were adding reasons for full text exclusion. So I found multiple entries for the same or similar reasons, inappropriate exclusion criteria. So I then need to manually adapt it on a separate Prisma chart to correct it. Um, some of them I had to go back to the authors for clarification, the other authors. 
some of the reasons really should have been added to the study records as a um, note um, rather than as an exclusion criteria. So while some of them were completely appropriate, some have full text available that should not be on an exclusion list that should be part of the notes field within the record itself. So duplicates should be recorded elsewhere. Um, you don't exclude it on the basis of what type of publication it is. Um, so there's a, a number in there. So I think that's a, a cautionary tale for just making sure that you have a standardised list as a team from right from the beginning to avoid that mistake. So the last section in criteria and exclusion reasons in Covidence is manage highlights. So in this area, you can actually create a controlled list of keywords to flag studies for potential inclusion or exclusion. Once these are set up and show highlights is selected during screening, the inclusion keywords will be highlighted in green and the exclusion in red. The keywords are selected from the title and abstract, so they will search it across the title and abstract for these words. So I've added one here, MERS COV, as a tag word for inclusion but we're not interested in retrospective studies. So we've tagged that as a word for exclusion. And this is what it actually looks like in Covidence with the record. So as you can see, the inclusion words are tagged green and the exclusion words are tagged red. So it could be that as soon as you see a, a red tag that you've created in the document, it might be um, an alert for all the authors that that might be a paper that should be excluded. And so now I'm going to hand you over to Miranda, who's going to talk about tag screening and adding full text papers. Thank you, Kirsty. I'll just share my screen. What I'm going to take you through now is the screening process, the, full the title and abstract screening and the full text screening. Before though, we will go in and look at some of the settings Kirsty has just been referring to and have them set up so we can use them throughout the screening process. So in the review summary screen, if we go into the settings and the areas Kirsty's just been talking about are here in your team settings, criteria and exclusion reasons and your study tags. So I'm going to add some criteria and exclusion reasons and some study tags. So the first thing we can set up here is the, your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And as has been mentioned, these need to be set up with team consensus if you're working as part of a group. So some of your inclusion criteria could be something like highlighting terms such as well-being, English, language we want to include, health, social determinants. And for our exclusion, we might like to include certain terms or certain types of study papers. So that's for your uh, title and abstract screening and your full text exclusion reasons. And you can also add your highlights so that as Kirsty was showing, you can see these words highlighted and it just makes that little bit more easy to use. You can also remove them if you decide you don't want those words anymore. Well. 
So once that you have set that area up, something else you can set up are study tags. So you can do that here in the settings. It is also possible to do it in the screening process. So there are some default ones that come with confidence that can't be deleted. But again, you can add tags as a way of sorting or filtering your results as well. So rather than having a highlight, you can add a tag that adds some other information. Perhaps the duplicate process hasn't highlighted everything, so you can do that manually, or you might like to highlight it's coming from a particular database. So again, for whatever tags you would like to add, but again, as has been mentioned, this should be done if you're doing it as part of a team with team consensus and everybody understands what they mean and how to use them. So they aren't just being added willy-nilly. So once your settings are ready to go, we will now go and have a look at the title and abstract screening process. So with the screening process, you can set these up, as has been mentioned, to do it in the single reviewer mode or two or dual reviewer mode. For a systematic review, the best practice option is to use a two reviewer mode. And this can be set up once again in your settings, in the review settings, you can see here, so reviewers required to screen full text or for the title abstract screening. I will leave it in uh, dual review mode for now. Also, you can see when you move into this process, you can see the team's progress. And you should also see if you have been set up as one of the reviewers, where you are at, in the process. It is also possible to set up in the team settings here as well and manage who can do what, as Kirsty has mentioned. So at the moment, everyone can do anything, but it is advisable to specify who will be your two reviewers and who will be the person who resolves any conflicts. Go back out. So once we click on continue and get into the process itself, there are a few options that you can use to make your reviewing a little bit more structured. So you can tell how many are displaying on the page at a time. You can sort them in um, a variety of ways. You can also filter. Perhaps you want to filter by a tag that you have added. You can also filter by the options below. And if you hit clear, that will remove any filtering. If we click on it again, that will remove that option. As I mentioned, those tags can be added at this point as well. To do this, you can select everything but anything that has been highlighted or selected will receive that tag. So by checking an option, the tags become active. And from here, you can select something that's already there. Or if you wish to add an additional tag, you can just start typing it in and say, create new. And when you do that, that tag will also be added to that reference that you've selected. And then the tag will appear at the base of the reference, as you can see here, and you can add multiple tags. So these might be useful for things you just want to highlight or make your fellow reviewers or yourself aware of regarding that particular reference. 
You can also have the criteria showing, so that the criteria we set up previously. So we can have an easy reminder of the options available to us. And you can also add those highlights that we set up earlier. So as Kirsty said, green for inclusion, red for exclusion. So you can see at a glance the um, key terms based on your inclusion and exclusion. You can also hide your abstracts. So there's some of the tools and functionality available to you. Also available are these view history. So you can see what has been applied to your reference. So at this point, we can see when it has been imported. You can also see voting and other options that have been applied. You can also add a note. So this is really useful for something where it's not an inclusion, it's not a tag, but you want to highlight something about that reference. Something such as perhaps full text available by a library, perhaps. You could also use the note field if you've uploaded a reference that didn't have um, an abstract. Unfortunately, you can't edit the reference itself, but you could add the abstract in the note field as a way around that. So once you have edited it, as you can see, you'll note who has created that note, what it is, when it was done. And you can also edit or re and or remove as required. And it will highlight, as you can see there, that there is a note available. Okay, so the actual voting process. So as you can see in the title and abstract screening, you have the option of yes, oops, of maybe and of no. So in single reviewer mode, if you vote yes or maybe, the reference will be moved on to the full text review. If you vote no, it will be removed from the list and added to the irrelevant references that you can see here. Also, if you're working in dual reviewer mode, so there's two of you, what will happen is if you are, the, you will work through the screening process separately and you won't know what each person has done. So that makes it blinded, which is what is required for a systematic review. If you are the first person to vote on a reference, it will be moved to the awaiting other reviewer area and you can see these areas listed across the top of the screen here. You will then, if you go, then go into that area, what you will see is your selection in the dark blue. At this stage, if the other person doing the reviewer in the dual re reviewer mode, You can change your option, your selection. So, and I'll return back to our main list. In the dual reviewer mode, if you are the second person to vote on that reference and it agrees with what the other person has voted, it will be moved to the full text review. So in that case, you both need to have voted either yes and yes, or yes and maybe. If your vote doesn't agree with the other viewer's vote, so you, perhaps it has been a no and a maybe, or a no and a yes, it will be moved to the resolve conflicts area. And then you will have a third reviewer who will make the final decision. So what that reviewer will see when they go into that resolve conflicts area, it's nothing there for us at the moment, but they will be asked to make a decision. So a yes, a no, or a maybe. And then based on their decision, it's either moved to the irrelevant 
references or moved to the full text screening. So for example, this one I might say yes to. This one I might also say yes. And yes again, maybe I'll say a no to that one. And maybe I'll say maybe to this one. Maybe on that one. Perhaps no. But basically, you just keep moving through that process and making your decisions, measuring your references against your inclusion and exclusion criteria. until you have reached the end of that. So, once you have completed your process, your screening, what would need to happen then is the full text review. And if there had been agreement between the both of you, then those options will show up in your full text review. So that's how the voting works. No will move, both of you have said no, it will remove and go into the irrelevant references. If both of you have said either yes or maybe to the same reference, it will move to the full text review. If you have voted no yes or no maybe, as both of you, it will remove to the resolve conflicts and your third reviewer will make the final decision. The next step in your systematic review is the full text review. And now we will look at how Covidence handles this. If we come into our full text review section, we can see we have a progress bar similar to what we saw in our title and abstract screening and you will also see how many papers you have to screen. If you are working with two reviewers, the, op the papers that will be available here are those where you have both voted the same way. So you can work independently of each other and you can work in the full text review even if you still have some papers in the title and abstract screening. The full text review section provides similar options to the title and abstract screening. You have your filter, tags, show criteria and show highlights options. You can also view the history and add a note. You also have an additional option to move a study back to the title and abstract screening if needed. You can also change how many it is displaying and in what order and by what field. The first thing to do is to add the full articles to each of your references. You can do this manually one by one or there is also a bog upload option. To add things one by one you can just click on the add full text button on the reference you need to do. Click on choose files if you wish to upload a PDF. Select the PDF you can also add a web address to a paper, but please be aware that if you are linking to subscription materials through UQ and you are collaborating with non-UQ people, this will not be a useful option. Once it is uploaded, the button will change to view full text. And when you go in here, you'll be able to link out to the PDF and it will open in a new tab. You can also remove a PDF, add another PDF or change a web address. The bulk upload option involves quite a few steps and the use of EndNote. We'd recommend if you don't have a large number of papers to add the full article for, 
to use the manual option rather than the bulk upload. To use this, the first thing we need to do is to create an XML file of the full text review papers with the PDFs attached using EndNote. Now you may already have an XML file containing many of the references in the full text review, but of course it may contain many that are no longer part of your review. So it's advisable to create a new list and XML file. First thing to do is to return to your review summary page and go to your export options. From here, EndNote provides a range of options for exporting. So you can select from which stage of your review. So obviously we'll go for our full text review and you can also select the format and we'll go with EndNote. Once it is finished downloading, you will get a download link in the recent exports section. Once you have then downloaded that file, which will be an RIS file type, the file type that EndNote will recognize, you will need to come out to EndNote and import that RIS file into your library. We'd recommend importing into a clean library so you're not interfering with existing ones. So to import, you can go to File and Import, same on the Macs. If you can't see these options on your Mac, just click on the Options button, which should be in the bottom left-hand corner. Select the RIS file that you have just downloaded. which may be viewing as a text file, same thing in this instance. And then select the import option of Reference Manager RIS. If you cannot see it in this initial window, go to other filters and it will be listed alphabetically there. Once you have imported those references, you then need to add the PDFs to them. And you can of course do this with your find full text or attach them if you have them already downloaded. However, before you start adding any PDFs, you first need to set up the correct naming convention. Confidence requires you to have your files, PDF files, either named author year or author year title. And you can set this up by going into your preferences, which is in Windows is under Edit, Preferences, and on a Mac, it's under EndNote X9 or X20 and Preferences. Come into the PDF Handling option and you can either select the author year in the auto renaming options or you can select the custom because it doesn't have an option for author year title year. It has author year title instead. And choosing custom, you can then select those three fields. We then apply that to your library. And then any PDFs you then attach will be correctly named. Now you may already have the PDFs attached, but they're not correctly named. So what you can do is bulk rename your PDFs. So first highlight them, that you, the ones you wish to change, and come up to references in the menu bar, same on a Mac, and come down to file attachments and rename PDFs. It will then say, were well, you sure you'd like to do this? And you can then select the field and the order of the fields that you would like to do. Once you have renamed everything, you are now ready to export them. So they can then be imported into Covidence. So to then export, highlight all the references you wish to send, come up to file, and export, choose the save as type as XML, and then create that file. We can now come back to Covidence and return to our full text review. and go into our bulk upload PDFs button here. So we can now select that file that we just created and upload it to Confidence. Once we are ready to go, 
it will then say it has found how many files to upload. And you can then click on show to see the ones that are rare. You now need to choose where you have those PDFs saved to upload them to Covenants. So once you've clicked on show, come over to select files and go to where you have those PDFs saved. Probably the easiest option is in your data folder related to your library. EndNote tends to have them all individually listed in folders. So you can expand those folders in Windows by going to the search box and typing in an asterisk. Once you have found them all, click on open and it will then start the upload process as we can see here. So if you have a large number of files, this may take a little bit of time depending on your internet speed. We can now then return to Covidence in the full text review. And those ones we've just uploaded will now have the view full text available to them. So once you have uploaded all your PDFs to your references, it is now time to vote. Now in the full text review, you have two options, include and exclude. If you are working with one reviewer, once they vote include, the reference will move to the data extraction section. If they vote to exclude, they also have to select a reason, which you would have set up earlier. They will then be moved to your excluded references. And you can see those by clicking on the option up the top here. And if needed, it can be moved back to the full text review. So if you accidentally click the wrong on excluded. If you're working with two reviewers, they again need to agree on how they vote when they vote. They also need to agree when in voting to exclude on the exclusion reason. So if both reviewers vote include, they will be moved to, the reference will be moved to the full text, to the data extraction section. If they both vote to exclude, they must also choose the same exclusion reason. And if that is the case, it will be moved to the excluded references area. However, if they disagree, so one votes include or exclude, or they both vote exclude, but for different exclusion reasons, they will be then moved to the resolve conflicts and the third reviewer will then vote from there. Also in two reviewer mode, if one reviewer has voted but the other has not, the paper will be moved to the other awaiting other reviewer section. And it is also possible from there to move it back into the full text screening. So when voting in the full text review, when you vote to exclude, there may be quite a few similar exclusion reasons which are valid, but then they will go into the, a conflict when there actually really isn't. What Covidence suggests to deal with this is to create a hierarchy of your exclusion reasons amongst the team and agree that the top reason in that hierarchy is the one chosen if that's the exclusion reason. So within the full text review, include, will move it on to the data extraction, exclude, for the same exclusion reasons, we'll move it to excluded. But if they disagree, include, exclude, or exclude for different reasons, it will be moved to the resolve complex for the third reviewer to vote on. That is how you can use your full text review in Covidence. I will now hand back to Kirsty.
Thanks, Miranda. I'll just um, share my screen. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at data extraction, the next uh, part of the process. Um, this is, so this happens once the screening process is completed, you've been through your title abstract screen, full text screen, so then you move on to the next section. So this step is to extract information from your included studies. Any included studies have been automatically been brought through to this stage by Covidence. Only a brief overview is provided on this section. Um, just keep in mind, as um, Marcos mentioned at the beginning, um, that this usually isn't part of librarian's brief uh, within the systematic review process. So we may be able to assist you with some of these things, but we may um, be more likely to refer you on to Covidence for clarification. And we are also going to provide some training links from Covidence at the end of the session. So the extraction section involves several important processes. So it's here that you're going to merge related references under one study. You can do a quality assessment or risk of bias assessment of your included studies and also data extraction of your included studies. Now, when I say merge as a study, it means you can merge multiple references and sub-studies under the main study. And you do this at extraction stage so that they are all kept under the one record. But please note that once you've merged a reference as a study, it can't be undone. So I would encourage you as a group to, again, reach consensus over which studies are sub-studies of a main study uh, before you actually officially merge them. So just a brief uh, overview of quality assessment. So the default, because Covidence is created by Cochrane, the def risk of um, bias or quality assessment is their own risk of bias assessment. So you can customise this to your own choice. Um, you can choose to customise your quality assessment assessment. So you may be using the Newcastle Ottawa score, the Downs and Black, you might be using JDAD. Whatever you're using, you can create this from scratch in Covidence in the quality assessment area. So for more information on this, Covidence have some guidelines that you can refer to. The next part of the process is the data extraction. So this is our form is based on your PICO, patient population problem, intervention, comparator outcome. So for each of your included studies, you record the summary. Um, you record a summary of the, the case, um, the identification details, what the methods are, population, including inclusion, exclusion criteria, intervention and outcomes. So for more support on how to do this um, and what it involves, you can refer to Covidence's um, guidelines there with the link provided. So I'm going to share some of the um, benefits and limitations of uh, Covidence software. Um, you may have seen some of those as we've gone through and we might have mentioned some of them. Um, one of the big benefits is easy to use. It's very user friendly. It's web based, so it allows um, and works well for numerous people um, working on a review at the same time. So wherever they are in the world, um, you can, can add it and it just works in real time. Another benefit is um, only one reviewer needs to be affiliated with UQ to take advantage of um, the license. Um, so any of your collaborators don't actually need to be part of UQ. It allows individuals to work through at their own pace. So it doesn't require full completion of different sections before other sections can be worked through. So um, as long as, depending on your settings, of course, if you've gone through all the titles and abstract screen and your colleagues halfway through and, and um, papers have already gone through to full text review, you can start doing the full text review, even though your colleagues haven't finished the title abstract screen. Um, so this can move, move it along quicker. 
It has an automatic deduplication function, although as with anything, these are not foolproof. Um, so you may still come across some duplicates. They might have been the same study published in different journals. Um, and so that might not have been picked up. So in terms of limitations, um, it doesn't export PDFs into other software packages. Um, if anyone wanted to go from Covidence to Invivo, they might prefer to go from EndNote to Invivo. It works better. As mentioned, it doesn't pick up less obvious um, duplicates. So there may be some manual changes required. In regards to the Prisma diagram, um, all the information that you put in there. So for example, as we were talking about the exclusion criteria at full text review, um, that information feeds into the Prisma diagram. Anything you do within Covidence feeds into the Prisma diagram, which is very convenient. However, it is basic and it might not meet the, the needs of some reviewers. So for example, it doesn't record records retrieved from various sources. So you might um, be hand searching and find some additional ones. They all get lumped in together. So whereas um, a lot of Prisma charts actually have two boxes at the top, one's for um, finding records through databases and another box to say through other means, Prisma only has the databases box at the top. It also um, is a bit simple at the bottom of the chart. So for example, um, it doesn't differentiate how many are included for qualitative review and then meta-analysis, for example. Now, um, Covidence has a place to record the search strategy and the inclusion criteria. So it's a good idea to put those in there. It's in a sense when you come to write up your review, it's really convenient because all the information is stored there, but it isn't actually part of the setup and it's not compulsory. So it's um, a functionality which is great, but um, because it's not part of the process, it can sometimes be overlooked. So more of the benefits are that you can set up authorization parameters. So who gets to do the screening? how many people can screen, and you can change exclusion criteria. Um, you can upload and store the full text papers at the point of full text retrieval, as Miranda showed you. Even though it, it, it's not actually, um, not actually a, a systematic review, it guides you through the process. So it doesn't actually tell you what to do in a systematic review, but it guides you through that process of um, retrieving papers, screening. I think it's fantastic for screening. Um, and then guides you through that whole critical appraisal, risk of bias assessment and extraction of data. Um, so it helps support you through the process. And you also don't need to do the entire process in Covidence. The strength of Covidence really lies in its screening. So if you only wanted to use Covidence for screening, you can, so you don't have to use it through the whole process if you don't want to. It um, has a place to record search strategies and inclusion exclusion criteria, although as mentioned, that's not compulsory. Um, as mentioned, it manages the reviewing of papers well, including the recording of decision making and managing of conflicts, um, which is fantastic and keeps, keeps um, the confidentiality of what's happening so you don't know which um, what the other reviewer has said um, which minimizes bias and of course it, it documents decision making process so some of the limitations we've been through as we've been along so one can have, add reasons for full text review exclusion. So this can lead to the become messy. I've heard of issues with exporting data into statistics program. Um, I'm not sure if that has been resolved, but just something to watch out for. And if you're having problems, get in touch with Covidence. I think this next one is related to the um, adding reasons for full text review exclusion in my example, because it doesn't actually alert 
um, reviewers to potential changes in the review. So someone might add a note, oh Kirsty, can you look something up or can you find this paper? I don't get alerted to that. So if I'm not, um, if I haven't been told or asked in an email or verbally or um, if I'm not constantly checking the review, I'm not going to get that message. So it really requires um, people to be checking, um, checking the review to see if there's anything that they need to do. So um, we gave some of these links in the class. Um, so quality assessment via covenants and data extraction for more information because we only provided a brief overview. You can um, find more information there. We'd like to thank you uh, for your interest in Covidence and for uh, hearing our class today. Um, I hope you found it useful. And again, I'm very grateful for any feedback. Thank you.